You're listening to the Sabina Road Baptist Sermon Series. We hope this message greatly impacts your life. For more information on the mission and ministries of Sabina Road Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona, visit us online at sabinaroad.org. It's almost uh, 2015. Can you believe it? Yeah, you're really excited about that. That's awesome. Okay. Many people make uh, New Year's resolutions. Some people um, call them just goals. They don't like the term for whatever reason, New Year's resolutions. And, but most people strive to think ahead, um, try to figure out a way to possibly make this coming year be a little better than the one we just came out of. So suppose in 2015, the thought enters your mind that you want to build a house. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? You sit down, you make a list of all the materials that you need. Then you order all of, all of the materials to be delivered to your lot where you're going to build. And uh, you tell the delivery guy, hey, just unload them over there right there in the center of the lot. Well, the next day, the bulldozer rolls in, coming in to dig the basement. And what does he find? He finds all the materials right in the middle of the lot, right in the way, exactly where he needs to dig. So what happened? Why, why is that all messed up? It's because we, there was a failure to plan. And so today I want to talk about making a plan. Um, you know, without some rudimentary planning, you probably won't have enough to eat, let alone build a house or a skyscraper or a plan a shopping mall or a, even a city. If producing shelter, food, and clothing, and uh, transportation is such a valuable thing that we realize that planning is a very, very valuable thing. Nothing but the simplest impulses may actually get done if we don't take time to plan, um, have some forethought, and to make a, a good plan. Now, we all understand this. We all practice it in some ways. You know, in relation to the very basic needs that we all have, um, we try to make sure that we have enough to eat. We try to make sure we have enough warm clothes. Yes? How many people making sure that they have warm clothes lately? Anybody? Okay. I know you guys have thin blood still, so I still don't. So it's, it's, I'm dying hot up here right now. It's unbelievable. But uh, while we take care of all of our physical needs and all of our physical necessities, my question is, do we take care of our spiritual needs? Do we, we, take, we, we make a point to um, take our spiritual needs um, really seriously? Do we apply the same passion in making sure that we uh, maximize our spiritual lives as we do in planning to make a living? So let's, there's a couple things that I would like to, hear, to, to, to do here today. Um, one is to try to persuade you to set aside some time in the coming year to specifically make a plan to grow spiritually. Um, it's important to grow in our relationship with God through prayer, through reading the Bible, and growth in your personal ministry by serving others, and sharing Christ with people that you know. You know, um, we were talking about the bulldozer before. Um, the bulldozer of, of God's spirit. It sounds like a weird phrase, but oftentimes God will come ready to do some work in our heart. And oftentimes we have stuff, piles of stuff that are just kind of in the way, and God's not really able to work it within our heart. And so... He kind of sees that due to some poor planning, he's not able to work in a, in a way that he might see that would really benefit us or that we might find a blessing out of. So I want to motivate you guys in four simple ways. The first one is some illustrations from the Proverbs on planning. The second one is some planning tips from the Apostle Paul. The third one is planning tips from God. And the fourth one is planning tips from, does anybody know? Jesus. Yeah, we're going to talk about Jesus today, not just planning. But uh, I put, uh, I've taken the liberty of putting up the verses up on the screen because I'm going to go through several uh, verses very quickly. So uh, you can follow on there, or if you want to grab the black Bible in front of you, you are more than welcome to follow along there um, and uh, do that. So the first one we're going to look at is Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. It says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, without having any chief, officer or ruler. She prepares her food in summer and gathers her sustenance in harvest. 
The ant is an example not only because it works so hard, but because it plans ahead. During the summer, it thinks about the wintertime. It realizes that there actually is going to be a need in the winter. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? You guys realize that, the ants do that? That's incredible to think about. Proverbs 14, 15 says, The simple believe everything, but the prudent looks where he is going. See, the difference between planning and not planning is whether you look where you're going in the future or whether you only focus all your attention on the immediate right in front of you. If you're not a planner, then you will be at the mercy of others who try to give you counsel on how to act now so as to be happy in the future. So the simple person will believe anything, it says, but the prudent looks where he is going. He considers the days to come and what they are bringing and thinks about the best way to prepare them and use them to accomplish his purposes. In Proverbs 15:22, it says, Without counsel, plans go wrong, but with many advisors, they succeed. Here, the wisdom of planning is taken for granted, and the writer simply gives us advice for how to make plans that actually succeed. He says, don't be so independent that you think yourself above counsel. Read the wisdom of others who have gone before you. Talk to experienced people and learn from them. Watch the way they do other things and learn from their mistakes and their successes. That kind of sounds like mentoring or apprenticeship. Yep. In Proverbs 16.3, he says, Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Again, planning is taken for granted. And the question now is, how can you plan in such a way that what you produce will have abiding value and not just pass away overnight? What is the answer to that? We commit it to the Lord. That is, always seek the Lord's guidance and strength in your planning. Trust His wisdom and not your own. Then, your plans will bear fruit that stay. In Proverbs 24, 27, it says, Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for you in the field. And after that, build your house. You know, this probably means that it's important to be able to support yourself by the productivity of the field before you establish your own household. In today's uh, culture, we'd say, hey, it's important for you to get a job before you get married, or something like that. Go to school, get educated, be able to support yourself, and then start a family. And that will at least uh, help you plan on how you're going to support your new, ho new household that you're establishing. In Proverbs 31, 15, and 16, this is a great verse. It says, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and tasks for her maidens. She considers a field when she buys it, and with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Here, the model homemaker is a, is a model planner in two different ways. She gets up early and assigns tasks to her maidens. You cannot assign tasks to your young ones if you have no plan of what you would like to have accomplished that day. Is that right? And she considers a field and buys it. What does she consider? She looks at how that is going to benefit her family and how it's going to work in in, into the plan of their household. So a conclusion from all these different Proverbs would be this. Careful planning is part of what makes a person wise and productive. Not to plan is considered foolish and dangerous. Amen? This is true even though each Proverbs... Uh, this is true even though the Proverbs do teach in uh, Proverbs 69 that a man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The fact that the Lord is ultimately in control of the future does not in any way mean that we shouldn't plan. It means that we should commit our work to the Lord and trust him to establish our plans according to his loving purposes. So the, now let's look at uh, one example from Paul's planning. From the many that we could take from Acts and from the letters. And this is just a summary of Romans 15. Let me, let me just read this for you. Um, I make it my, uh, I'm going to be at Romans 15, 20 through 28. And like I said, it's going to be a, a summary. I make it my ambition or my plan to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on another man's foundation. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and be sped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem with the aid of the saints. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been raised, I shall go, I shall go on by the way of you 
on to Spain. So that's Paul basically setting up his plan. And it's a typical example of how he carried out his missions. And Paul has been pretty, uh, I, I guess we could all agree that he's been fairly impactful in the kingdom of Christ. Yes? Yeah. I think we should learn from him. Um, planning is essential to a productive ministry. And I mean your personal ministry as well as a, some kind of complex organism like our various church ministries. Paul was the greatest church planner who ever lived. So I think we should would do well to take seriously his method. And part of his method was definitely planning. He had a general guideline. And that guideline was he wanted to preach where no one else had yet preached. He then developed a specific plan from the guideline. He would take the, take the financial gift to Jerusalem. Then he would go to Rome to establish a western base. And then he was going to go on to Spain and preach the gospel. What makes this especially significant is that as far as we know, the plan fell through. He was arrested in Jerusalem. He was taken to uh, Rome as a prisoner, and he most likely never got to Spain. It's just like we saw in Proverbs. God is the one who finally makes the future. Now, we plan nevertheless, but God uses our planning even if he ultimately changes it. For example, if Paul had not planned to use Rome as a base op of operations for a trip to Spain, he perhaps may have never written the greatest letter that the world has ever known. And that's the, the epistle of Romans. Planning is crucial in Christian living and in Christian ministry, even when God overrules our planning. So don't forget that it is also in Romans, verses 8, 28, that it says that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So let's look at the planning uh, of God. The ultimate reason for the planning, uh, for planning is that God is a God who plans. But we are created in his image to exercise dominion in the earth under his lordship. I can't even really conceive um, of a God um, who does not act accordingly to his own eternal planning. That is a God who may have some kind of knee-jerk reaction to some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, stimuli or, or issue that, that comes up, rather than a God that is totally has deliberate actions that fit into a wise purpose. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. In Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, it says, God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. In Acts 2, 23, it says that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. Since God is a God who does all things according to a plan, it is reasonable for us to approach the important things of life with forethought and planning, and not haphazardly. The planning of Jesus. Jesus had a mission to accomplish, yes? And he finished it with forethought and planning. And when his mother urged him to uh, do his first miracle, well, to, to do a miracle, which happened to be his first at the wedding of Cana, uh, he said, my hour is not yet come. There was a plan, appointed hour for the, re the revelation of his power. And he would stay with that plan. Luke 9:51 says that when the days grew near for him to be received up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew that the plan meant death in Jerusalem, and he didn't shrink back from that plan. But he wasn't driven against his will. The Father's plan was his plan. He said in John 10:18 that no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So very specifically today, my plea to you this new year is, is that you take time to plan the most important things in your life. Plan how you're going to spend time with your spouse and deepen and strengthen that relationship. Plan how you're going to spend time playing, playing with and teaching your kids. Plan how you're going to get the amount of exercise that you need to get healthy. I know I have already. Plan how you're going to get enough sleep. Plan how much you're going to eat and how, mu and how you're going to not take in so much.
plan your vacation so that it really actually provides you with rest and spiritual renewal. Plan how you can grow further in your profession and other areas of interest. And most importantly, we as a staff want to encourage you to plan how to pray and to read your Bible, to love and to serve others. And these are going to be, we hope that these will be significant parts of your life in 2015. Without a plan, these most important things always will get pushed aside because life is just busy, yes? But it won't work just to plan something tonight or tomorrow, okay? Planning must be a regular part of your life. So we're asking you to set aside time each week to plan, especially to plan an effective way to grow in your spiritual life. For example, Sunday is the first day of the week. It's not actually the last day of the weekend. It's the first day of the week, and it, uh, and it belongs to the Lord. So take 10 or 15 minutes each Sunday to think through or to make a plan, and when you pray, uh, uh, make a plan of when you'll pray, and how you'll grow closer to God that week. Give some thought on how God might use you that week in a special way. Plan the letters or emails that you'll want to write to other people. The Bible verses that you actually may want to, to read or memorize to make it a part of you. Um, the people that you want to visit. The book you may want to read. The neighbors you want to talk to. Or the place you want to help out and serve. The Proverbs teach us to plan. The greatest missionary who ever lived was a planner. God is a God who does all things according to a plan. And Jesus, our Savior, he set his face to go to Jerusalem because of the most loving plan ever devised. He planned for our joy. We ought to plan for his glory. The Christmas season certainly is the most wonderful time of the year. And it clearly reminds us of the greatest plan of all. God the Father had the master plan of sending the Messiah, Jesus, the creator of all things to the earth. He showed how to love God and to love people. Then in obedience to the Father's plan, he allowed himself to be beaten, crucified, put to death for us on a cross. Thus Jesus became the perfect sacrifice that was needed for our, us to be able to attain uh, forgiveness for our sins. He became our Savior. He then demonstrated his absolute dominance and lordship over creation, physics, life, and death. And on the third day after his death, he rose again. He talked with Mary, the disciples, and many others. Matter of fact, 500, uh, over 500 witnesses saw Jesus after he was risen. Many of those were present to see Jesus ascend to heaven. And these same Christ followers were then empowered by the Holy Spirit 40 days later to go and to tell the story of Jesus. They absolutely changed the world. And we too, like those early Christians, have a story to tell. A story that God can use to tell his good news to others. Each story, your story, is unique from its own experiences. And it's a story that God can use to share his good news to others. This good news changed the world before and it still has the power today to change lives. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that? The power of Christ can change lives. So make a plan. A plan to establish a time in your schedule in order to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Make a plan to help be part of what God is doing. Daily asking God to open your eyes at what he's doing around you. Make a plan to allow yourself to be used by God. Allow your schedule to become more flexible. And strive not to cram every moment of every day with tasks and events good, bad, or otherwise, so that you can pre-plan and intentionally leave time for God to use you in a very special way. I believe that we were saved to share the good news. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is Jesus' great commission to all of us. That we are to go into all the world and to share the good news of Jesus. So go, tell, tell the gospel, share the good news of Jesus with others. Let's make a plan, okay? Let me pray.